What's up, everybody, and welcome back to In Search of Answers, the series where you ask me questions and I do my best to ramble somewhat coherently in the approximate direction of an answer. Um, we have a, a couple of good questions this week, and actually a lot of really good discussion that came out of last week's episode. And I wanted to talk about that a little bit. I wanted to look into some of the comments that were left on uh, on the last on the previous episode because I do read all the comments. And one thing that I've really been enjoying about this series is watching the discussions that then take place. Like I will, I will put an idea out there, and then other people are giving their own thoughts on it. And that's just something that I really love to like. I really love to be able to observe that and see what other people are thinking about things that I have to say. So uh, what I wanted to do was respond to a couple of the thoughts that were made in response in turn to what I said in last week's episode, uh, as well as point out a couple of really good points that some people brought up in the comments as well. I'm going to start with this one from, uh, I believe it's Derailed, maybe it's Derailed, I'm not sure, uh, who said, I think that beyond negativity bias, there's also been a shift in tone over the last decade or so, leading to a more adversarial slash hostile relationship between players and mainstream video game companies. Uh, they went on to say broken launches, day one DLCs, early access pre-orders, abusive slash coercive micro slash macro transactions, and many, many other things on a long scummy list of practices of make the line go up year after year. Meanwhile, social media has never been more populated and information so easily accessible, leading to a broader awareness and tiredness with these companies and their practices. And the actual comment that they left was much longer. They went into a lot more detail uh, and explained a lot more of what they were thinking. Um, and then there was a, an interesting sort of back and forth that occurred after that where someone else mentioned like, okay, but arcade games used to be a thing back in the day. And those were literally designed for you to just pump as many quarters as possible into to the extent where oftentimes you were spending more money on an arcade machine than you would have ever spent on a video game even nowadays. Um, they, they didn't say all of that directly, but that was kind of what I felt like was the point that they were getting to which the other uh, Daryl then responded to and said, yeah, that's more or less what I was saying, which is that this has always been around. It just feels much worse and it has become much more prevalent in this day and age. Again, I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit from memory of exactly what was said. Um, it is worth noting, by the way, just before I continue with this, this line of discussion, um, it is worth noting that video games are actually one of the very few luxuries that has not dramatically increased in price, at least in terms of box prices over the last couple of decades. Like, I remember back when the Nintendo 64 first came out and one of the big, like even when I was like, I don't know, 16, 17 when it came out, something like that. Uh, no, I would have been 14 when it came out. Anyway, uh, I remember even back then as a kid being like, okay, yeah, an N64 would be great, but the games are so expensive. I'm not going to, if I get an N64 for Christmas versus a PlayStation for Christmas, I'm not going to be able to convince my parents to buy as many games because the games are so expensive. Because in 1997, when the Nintendo 64 came out, Super Mario 64 was considered one of the most expensive games of all time. It was so incredibly expensive in 1997, and it cost $70. The same price that constantly gets pushed around today as a very expensive video game. And this was in 1997. Like The fact that the price has stayed the same for a quote-unquote expensive video game all that time is actually kind of crazy when you account for inflation. Like I, I looked it up just before I started recording this and one US dollar in 1997 uh, would be worth almost double today, $1.93 today. So like if the cost of video games, if the box price at the very least of video games had kept with what it was when the Nintendo 64 came out, video games would cost $140 to just buy that off the shelf nowadays. Now, obviously there's a lot more to the cost of video games in these days, like some of the stuff that Daryl was just talking about, all the microtransactions, things like battle passes. And obviously it's still, it, it doesn't feel great when you spend $70 on a video game and then it immediately wants you to spend another $30 on a season pass or another $20 on some cosmetic item or something like that. I, I'm not saying that video games still cost the same amount that they did back in 1997, the point there is more just the price of video games and the amount of your general budget that goes towards video games. If you are an avid gamer who wants to play everything has not significantly increased, at least at the same rate that other things like movie tickets and so on have increased over the last like decade or so. Anyway, that's kind of a side point. It's just something I wanted to point out as something that I find interesting um, that the cost of games is seen as so high nowadays when it really hasn't changed that much, at least in the box price over the last decade or so. And I think part of why that cost is uh, is seen as so high still is because of what we were just talking about, what people like Daryl are saying, 
where there's all these extra costs on top of things nowadays. It is not uncommon at all to buy a $70 video game. And then, like I said, you, you're immediately then expected to spend another 20 to $30 on a battle pass or whatever. Of course, there's lots of free to play games that are then much the same where you're really only spending like you can play this game for a couple of years and only have spent like 50 or 60 bucks in total on it over battle passes for a while. So anyway, food for thought on that one. The point that um, Daryl was coming to in this in this comment, the reason that I wanted to point it out is because they, they did bring up a couple of very important things um, that I failed to mention in last week's episode when we were talking about why gaming communities can feel so negative these days. Um, and one of those was the, the, the like general nickel and diming that tends to happen nowadays where there's uh, games come out in early access and they're unfinished, but you still have to pay full price for them. Uh, games like the, the advent of pre-purchase over pre-order, uh, side note, there's a slight difference there. A pre-order is something that you, uh, you go and you say, I would like, like if you went to a GameStop and you say, I'd like to pre-order the next Gran Turismo or whatever. I don't even know if they still make those, but I want to pre-order the next Gran Turismo. Uh, you would put your $5 in. And then you would have that like reserved for you. So you could come in and completely purchase it when it comes out. A pre-purchase is when you are buying the game before you're even ever going to get a chance to play it. And the, the reason that there's an important distinction there is largely a legal one. Uh, a pre-order can be refunded just because you just you changed your mind. Uh, a pre-purchase is something where, you no, know, you've already spent that money. And typically you don't have the ability to get that back unless the publisher does something really crazy like it doesn't release even remotely when they said it was or something like that anyway again just a little bit of a tangent there i don't know i'm all over the place today but um there was something interesting that i wanted to note anyway talking about things like broken launches day one dlcs uh early access pre-orders micro man uh, macro transactions yes that, that's definitely something that even if the cost, like even in things work out to where the cost, the actual monetary cost isn't higher than it was back in 1997 with the Nintendo 64, it still feels, and I do think it ends up being higher, just to be clear, but it still feels bad to have spent money on a game and then have it constantly being asking you for more money when you're finding issues with the game on top of that. If you're really enjoying a game and it's like, like right now, I have not seen anyone complaining about the cost necessarily of the uh, the Elden Ring DLC that just came out. Haven't seen any complaints about the cost of it whatsoever. Seen a lot of complaints about the difficulty. Obviously, the the Steam reviews are getting a bit weird. Um, I I feel like a lot of those people forgot that they were buying a Souls game, but whatever. That's a completely separate topic on its own. Uh, the cost of things like a DLC for a game that you love and want to play more of. If it's something that you feel like you're getting value as a player, then you're less likely to be upset by it. Uh, you might still grumble at it a little bit and be like, oh, I don't, I don't really like that. But like for me, for example, um, as someone who's played a lot of Conan Exiles, I never felt bad about buying the battle pass for Conan. They just retired it and I actually kind of sucks. I, I kind of liked the battle pass in Conan Exiles, but I never felt bad about buying the battle pass in Conan Exiles because it was a game that I enjoyed and I, I just didn't feel bad about spending that money to get more of a game that I enjoyed. Um, same thing for uh, for me, Marvel Snap is a game that I play literally every day um, and I, I get the battle pass every month because it's a game that I really enjoy playing and it's like 10 bucks. So it's like I, I enjoy this. I want to I want to get extra stuff out of it when the cost is a result uh, or, or when you're when you're spending that money on a product and or, or being asked for that money on a product that you are having issues with or you're finding things that you don't enjoy with. It definitely feels much worse. And just in general the way that monetization models work nowadays does end up breeding a lot more negativity than what we used to see when it was like, oh, I spent, you know, 60, $70 on this and four months in, I'm still playing. Like I spent however much on Halo and four months in, I'm not having as much fun with Halo anymore. In this case, like Halo isn't asking you for more money that entire time, but at least it didn't used to back in like the Halo 2, Halo 3 days. Uh, it didn't used to ask you for more money. Uh, that, that at least feels like, oh, I spent the money and now I'm just getting tired of the game. It was something that was easier for people to walk away from. Um, games like Baldur's Gate, for example, people were uh, kind of balking at the $60 price a little bit, which again, is not actually that expensive. Uh, but that's a game that Baldur's Gate came out and people loved and they played for ages. And everyone who, I, I have not heard anyone who actually bought Baldur's Gate and played, I'm sure this per person exists, but it seems like the majority of people at the very least who bought Baldur's Gate 3 have not ended up complaining about the price because it felt like it was worth the money that they spent on it. And they're not getting nickel and dime constantly. They're not being asked for more money constantly. So anyway, uh, that's a, that's a really good point that, that Daryl brought up. The other one that they mentioned was social media. And it's very true that in this day and age, especially over the last like 
I don't know, six to eight years, uh, probably a little bit over the last decade, we'll say, um, it's become so much easier to have negativity put in your face un unwanted because of the nature of social media and how ideas spread. And you might be like, you follow somebody who you, you know, you maybe you did some arenas with, maybe you you met them through a Mythic Plus group or something like that. And you're like, hey, okay, cool. You became friends. You ended up following them. And then you're just seeing them retweet what people are complaining about in the video game constantly when that's not a discussion that the two of you have ever had, but now you're seeing it. It's not getting presented to you constantly. That's the sort of situation that can happen much more regularly in this day of age, a uh, day and age due to the way that information flows through social media. And that, again, because the things that people tend to focus on are the things that tend to spark the most discussion and the most back and forth involve negativity in some way. Even if it starts with someone, this is another point that someone else made in the comments, even if it starts with someone saying positive things about the game, like, oh, I really like this, that almost invariably, especially on social media, will eventually find its way to someone who then wants to complain about the thing that you said that you liked. They're like, well, if you like this, then you're wrong and you get argued with about it. So even things that start with positivity can end up having negativity in, involved in it. And just the nature of negativity in general is like once it's there, it kind of taints the well a bit, it kind of turns that into a negative experience. And you, it's hard to out positive negativity. That's just like a nature of human life as it is. So that's definitely worth mentioning as well. Like the, the nature of social media helps negativity spread much more than it used to. I do think just as an aside, I'm apparently doing a lot of these today. Um, I do think social media is an overall net positive, but it's one of those net positives that comes with a lot of negatives attached to it as well. Um, so those were worth, uh, those, that was a, a really, really good couple of comments that I felt was worth calling out um, and pointing out a couple of things that I, I missed to mention in uh, last week's episode. So thank you so much, Daryl, for that comment. It was, it was really, really um, good extra stuff to think about. Um, I also want to call out this comment from Lost One Head, uh, who said, I'm probably in a minority, but I really don't care about knowing all the details of the game development process, about devs, quote unquote, listening, etc. I find it weird that modern day gamers often treat game developers as their local politicians, expecting them to listen to all their complaints and all that. I want to have fun in games, not assist devs in making them. And that last line in particular really resonated with me. And I feel like a lot of gamers are much in the same boat where you feel like you, you just want to have fun. You just want to be entertained. You bought a video game because you wanted to be entertained for a while. You don't like go to a movie and sit there and watch it. And halfway through the movie, the director pops up and says, hey, by the way, are you enjoying this story? Is this plot twist interesting enough to you? Is this character relatable? Is this villain? Do they feel tragic? Like that, it's not something that occurs if you go and watch a movie. Whereas with a video game, it's so often the case that you can then feel like you need to be giving that level of feedback, especially for a live service game uh, or a multiplayer game. It is, it's very easy to end up feeling like you need to be giving that feedback to the developers to create a game that you want to play. Um, and for a lot of reasons, that can be very good. That's, that's something that a lot of players really do enjoy. But a lot of other players definitely really feel like, no, I don't I don't want to be part of the development of this video game. I just want there to be a good video game that then I can play. And I think that's completely fair. I think that is a completely fair perspective. Um, and again, it, it can be difficult to get away from that environment if that's not what you're after. It's so easy nowadays to like try and engage in a discussion. Like maybe you're in a Discord with uh, some other people that play the game, not necessarily even the developer-led Discord, but like, you find a Discord and it's like, oh, this is a bunch of fans of this game and I want to learn how to play it a little bit better. So I'm going to join in here. Uh, and then you say, yeah, but this whole thing kind of bothered me a little bit. And it's easy for that to then go, well, you should go and give. if you haven't given that feedback to the developers, then you don't have any right to complain. And I think it's OK for a player to not like something in a video game and not feel like it's their responsibility to go and tell the developers that they didn't like it. Obviously, that's helpful to the development team if it's done, you know, in a constructive manner. That's helpful to the development team to help them understand things that could be changed about their game. But it's not the player's responsibility to tell the developers how to make the game. It's the developer's responsibility, ultimately, to make a good video game. Um, and that's why community feedback is often so, it's seen as so valuable to developers and so appreciated by most developers, I would say. Because it's something that the most development teams really understand. Like, it's not your job to tell me how to make the video game. It's my job to make the video game. It's your job to enjoy it and have fun with it. Um, so I, I don't think this is an unfair perspective whatsoever. 
Um, and I don't even necessarily think like they, they started by saying I'm probably in a minority. I don't even necessarily think that's a minority uh, viewpoint. I think it's just something that people don't talk about a lot because again, it's so easy to say, I don't want to, I don't want to tell people how to make their video game. I just want to have a fun video game and then get sort of bandwagoned on a little bit where people go, well, but you have to give them this feedback or else how will they know to make the game better? And the answer to that question is because they're game developers and they should be learning how to make better games just as part of how, like, that's that's literally the job. You, you get better at the job the more you do it. And there are still lots of people and lots of gamers who want to be able to give that feedback and who are excited to be able to give that feedback. Um, and that's that actually makes the game more enjoyable to them when the developer is listening and feels like they are responding to complaints that the, the player base is bringing up or responding to feedback that the player base is giving up or bringing up. Um, and I don't think that's wrong either. I just think it's two different perspectives and both of them are completely fair. It is fine to say, I want a game that I just play and have fun with and I don't need to be part of the development process. And it's also fair to say, I want to be part of the development process so that I feel like I can have an impact on the game by giving my feedback. Both of these are completely fair and valid viewpoints. I just wanted to illustrate this one and bring this one up a little bit because I think it's something that doesn't get talked about a whole lot is that concept of, I just want to be able to play a fun video game and let the developers figure out how to make it be fun. I don't want it to be my responsibility to tell the developers how to make their game more fun. Anyway, those were some really great points. So thanks again, everyone who has been leaving comments um, because it's it's really, really, I do read all of the comments and it's really interesting to, to me and really cool to see this level of discussion coming out of these sort of half-baked, half-the-time thoughts that I'm just sort of spewing off the top of my head. Um, I don't do like scripting or anything for this show at all, by the way. This is all just stuff that I, I read a, a comment, I read a question, and I go, hey, that's an interesting one that I think I have some comments to make on that, so I'm going to talk about that, but this is all just coming off the top of my head as I'm talking here. So I will occasionally note something down like a number, like the earlier the inflation level, I, I put a note what that is just so I could reference it later because otherwise I'll forget. Um, but that's that's about it. So this is all stuff that just comes off the top of my head, which is why I really enjoy seeing the comments and the, the continued discussion because it helps me remember things like that I forgot to mention, like the advent of social media and uh, predatory monetization practices in last week's episode. I just literally blanked on mentioning those when we were talking about why things can be so negative. It's really cool. So thank you all for uh, the continued comments. Uh, we are going to move on to uh, what will be the final topic for today, which is a question that came in from Midnight TV. Um, and it was a somewhat long-winded question, so I've, I've reduced it down a little bit here. We'll, we'll talk about a little bit more of what I reduced afterwards. But the question is, uh, with the advent of 20-man mythic rating the last 10 years, there was a steep divide, excuse me, a steep divide amongst some regarding the change, and many have asked for a return of 10-man mythic content. Wow, I said that really weird. I'm going to say that again. With the advent of 20-man mythic rating the last 10 years, there was a steep divide against. Uh, hmm. With the advent of 20-man, with the advent of 20-man mythic rating the last 10 years, there was a steep divide amongst some regarding the change, and many have asked for a return of 10-man mythic content. I was fervently against a 10-man version. However, after trying to run a mythic guild earlier this expansion. I'm backtracking a bit and would like to see a 16-man Mythic as the roster boss hits hard and is undefeated. Do you think reducing Mythic raid size is a good thing? Now, one other thing that they mentioned in this comment uh, was referring to an old Weekly Marmot video that uh, has now been taken down because of the whole, like, I, I've mentioned this before, but the whole, like, um, Zam selling to Fanbyte and then Fanbyte just decided to reuse that channel and deleted everything that was on there for some reason. I don't know why you would do that, but that's what they did. Um, so that's that's why the video is no longer accessible, and that's why many of the old Weekly Marmot videos are no longer online in any sense, which is unfortunate. Um, and I I don't have copies of all those. I would upload them, and then I would go through and delete my local copies once they were up on YouTube because I had no expectation that I was all going to delete at some point. So that was, a, that was a mistake of mine that I made back then. Regardless, I, I couldn't go back and actually see what I said in the video back then. I will say there are probably some ways that my opinions have changed over the last decade. Like it's been a long time since I did that. Uh, so there's probably some ways that my opinions have changed. Again, I don't remember exactly what I said, but the thing that, uh, that this commenter pointed out uh, was the idea that hardcore rating was becoming much more accessible and thus losing its prestige. And the reason that I wanted to mention that is because I don't think people being able to take on a challenge, people being more, uh, making it easier for people to even approach a challenge in the first place makes it less prestigious to have then completed that challenge. I don't think in 2024 that allowing more people to do a thing 
makes that thing less prestigious when you actually complete it. As long as it's still a challenge, as long as it's still something that is difficult and that requires uh, significant effort, uh, in the case of raiding, things like coordination, things like working together as a team, as long as it still requires all of that, it still feels prestigious to me to have completed it, uh, even if it's, you know, easier for, like, I, I don't think, basically, I don't think smaller group numbers necessarily means that it's not prestigious anymore to have completed this content. I think there's still effort that goes into it. There's still a lot of effort that goes into it. And in fact, in a lot of ways, I actually think reducing the size of a raid could allow the development team to then increase the difficulty in some other ways uh, by the fact that now they can expect people to be much more tight knit and they can expect there to be like, basically having fewer people in the raid means fewer points of potential failure inside of a given attempt, which then means that tuning can be tighter. Now, before I continue on this line of topic, I, I do want to point out a couple of things. One, I haven't done mythic raiding in a long time. Um, the last time I was really seriously raiding at all uh, was during Legion. Um, and even then, we, we basically we did heroic and we didn't really step into mythic too much. Um, I, I pretty much haven't been able to, since, since I moved to California to start to work at Blizzard, I had to, I had to stop raiding with my guild at the time because they were an East Coast guild. I was now on West Coast time. I just couldn't make the raid times anymore. Um, and I haven't really been able to keep up with hardcore rating since then in, in retail. So um, for a lot of you, that, that basically means I haven't done really any like super bleeding edge, like progression rating uh, since Mists of Pandaria. So for a lot of people, that means that their opinions on this are much more valid than mine. I just haven't lived that life in a long time. So I, I will definitely leave it open to further discussion and further viewpoints on specifically what this means for mythic rating and exactly how it would affect it. What I can do, however, as part of this discussion is at least illustrate some of the ways that the change in raid size would adjust things. And then you can make your own decisions about whether or not you feel that would be a positive or a negative thing overall for the game. One big thing that immediately jumps to mind for me uh, with the change from uh, 20 to 10 or even from 10 to 20, as we've recently seen in Season of Discovery, is that uh, when you have more players in a raid, you have then have uh, more variety or it's more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You are more likely to have an individual class or an individual ability or someone that can do a specific thing in that raid. So um, for Season of Discovery, when we went up to 20 players, it then became more likely that you had all of the raid buffs for Classic. It becomes more likely that you have a Priest to use Shackle Undead. It becomes more likely that you have a Warlock to use Banish. So you could have a fight where you do need a Priest in a larger raid, where, excuse me, in a, in a 10 player raid, you maybe wouldn't want to necessarily count on that. Season of Discovery has had some issues with how they actually approach that, which I've talked about in, um, actually in the most recent Sounds Good Makes Sense. I talked about that a fair bit, how they, they had these opportunities and kind of misplayed it a little bit, but that still is something that can be done. If you have more players in a raid, you then have more expectation of, the, and the more ability to have uh, specific class specific abilities that you rely on which in turn means that going from uh, 20 down to 10, you would have the issue then of, well, maybe we have to, uh, I think we're already kind of there with Dragonflight uh, and especially with War Within, but it would mean that there is more of a requirement to make sure that the commonly needed tools, things like Battle Reses, things like uh, Bloodlust and so on, uh, all make sure that all of these are accessible on a wider variety of classes. Um, which is part of what led to things like the removal of raid buffs ages ago in World of Warcraft in a lot of different ways, because it was like, okay, we can we can have smaller group content if we don't need to stack the raid. We don't need to expect that a 10-player raid has each of our however many classes are in World of Warcraft at this point, which is another thing that's worth pointing out. Um, and uh, in 20-player content, you have room for one of every class, uh, with where things are in WoW now, with 10-player content, you would not. Um, now, I know the comment here specifically said 16-player content. Uh, I think 16 is a weird number just because of how World of Warcraft works. Like, that would mean you have someone in a group by themselves. Um, I think if there were some adjustments to how raid groups work, uh, there were some adjustments made to how, like, things are, like, basically make it so it's not broken up into groups of five anymore, then it might make sense. Um, but that would also require some sweeping changes across the entirety of WoW. Like, then you need to think about, like, okay, well, what does a dungeon group mean then? Does, do dungeons go up to six? Do they go down to four? Um, there's there's some issues that would arise from trying to do that. Um, I think 15 probably makes more sense in the current paradigm, at the very least, in the current way that WoW works. 
15 could make some sense. And that would still allow for one of every class if you if you wanted to do that. You don't necessarily need one of every class, but that does mean that there there isn't like, oh, we're a raid that just doesn't have a hunter because we didn't have room for a hunter, for example. Um, those are those are just some things to keep in mind, I guess, uh, as part of that, uh, or a thing, I guess, to keep in mind as part of that. Um, there's also the the issue of um, encounter design. And I think part of why 20 player has been what Blizzard ended up gravitating towards for Mythic is that it means it's easier for you to take one member of your raid and say you have a job for a second as part of this encounter. It's easier to be like, there's a mechanic and it picks one person in your raid and gives them a task to go and do uh, when that's not one tenth of your raid, right? When it's one twentieth of your raid, that's significantly less of an overall impact, which means that they can still have a real fight going on the entire rest of the time uh, and not worry about how you've just accidentally picked half of your healers or whatever, or having to create mechanics that then can't target healers because they need to make sure that the healers are still around. Um, there, there are issues with encounter design going to smaller raid sizes that, that arise as a result of that. I will say on the flip side, there are then potentials for it to become tighter in cases where you do need to, uh, the, the whole fewer points of failure thing that I was talking about a minute ago, there is ways to make the tuning a bit tighter when it comes to that. Um, but I think it, it limits some of the options in terms of creativity in terms of what the encounters could actually be. Now, again, I haven't been like top level rating in a long time. Uh, so I, I can't speak to specifically what the current state of the game is and, and how well it's accomplishing any of that right now. Uh, because I haven't lived that. I've, I've watched it. I've seen pretty much every race to world first since then. But then again, that's literally watching like the top guilds, not necessarily the the people who are in the, you know, top 200, top 500 sort of area where it's still just as hard, but uh, you don't have the name like Liquid or whatever behind you to be able to to pull in all the, the recruitment to be able to make sure that you're filling things. So hopefully that's at least some interesting thoughts about it. Again, I, I, I don't really... I don't want to try to give my opinion uh, directly of if I think reducing the raid size of Mythic rating would be a good idea or not, because I don't I don't have the perspective to be able to make that uh, pr opinion. I would rather go ask people who are doing this content uh, and see what they say. So if you have any thoughts on that, if you are a Mythic Raider right now, I would love to hear what your thoughts are on uh, Mythic rating and whether or not 20 players is the correct size or if it should slim down to 10 knowing that that will come with some sacrifices that need to be made elsewhere in terms of encounter design and in terms of class design to some extent. Anyway, we're going to wrap it up there. Thank you all so much for watching slash listening, etc. A reminder, if you have a question that you would like to potentially have answered here on the show, um, best way to do that, just leave a comment here on YouTube, ask me that question. Um, or if you're a patron, you can head over to patreon.com slash devilor. Uh, and you can leave a comment either on the posting for this episode that will be over on Patreon, or uh, there will be a link to a form in that that you can fill out uh, to ask your question there. And patrons do get priority on having their questions answered here on the show. All right, that was that was an episode. I I, th I think we have concluded this episode. Thanks again so much, everybody. I'll see you later.